So tonight, we're going to have a discussion on things related to Israel, historical Israel, biblical Israel. We'll throw in some current events too, and, uh, and things Jewish. So if you, if you have questions, we're actually going to, he and I are going to have a conversation for the first like 25 minutes or so. And then the last 20 minutes, you can text in your questions. You can text in your questions anytime during the service, and we'll get to the questions at the end of the service. And so, do we have the number? There you go, 703 844 9969. And uh, you can text in your questions anytime. But things related to Israel, related to Judaism, related to things historical or biblical Israel, so, uh, or, or current events, if you have a question about things going on right now. We were talking earlier about what's happening in Israel right now. There's some protests going on and Netanyahu's going for kind of a power grab. It's kind of a weird thing happening right now in Israel. But anyway, that's the format for tonight. And so I'm happy to have my good friend with me. How many of you have been on a tour with me to Israel? And you know, you've seen Ronnie, you've met him before. For those of you who haven't met him, uh, you'll, you'll love this man. Give a warm welcome to Ronnie Cohen. Now, I, this guy, I'm telling you, he is a walking encyclopedia and not just about things Israel. He knows everything about culture around the world. Born in New York. And I know everything about John Singleton Mosby. Yes, he's a very, he's a Civil War buff and we're going to uh, Gettysburg together on July 3rd. But I'm telling you, I have never <clears throat> met a man who knows so much about culture, music, history, everything. You seriously are the most well-informed person I've ever met. I'm not exaggerating. From New York. Yeah, <laughs> from New York. Uh, but so, raised in a Jewish home, um, fought in Vietnam in the LERPS, the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol Unit. Um, and then you made Aliyah to Israel. Yeah. How old were you when you went to Israel? Um, I arrived just before my 22nd birthday. And so what do you have to do when you go to Israel? You're making Aliyah, you're saying I'm Jewish. Well, what, I didn't, what papers I, well, do you have to, I, you didn't really make Aliyah. No, no, Okay, no. so that's. This, this is the thing. I was, you know, one of the people traveling around in the early 70s. Yeah, long hair. You know, and it was what was called the hippie trail. The hippie trail led you to that Israel. That went all the way to India. So we went overland from India, all through Greece and Turkey and Afghanistan, and you know, I went to India to find myself. Yeah. So I was there for about five months, and um, I noticed I wasn't there, so I left. <laughs> you, you never found yourself. <laughs> and um, I just happened to be in Turkey, very early February 1974. There was a snowstorm. I had no place to go. I had like no money. And I was pretty desolate. I, I mean, I never had any inclination whatsoever to go to Israel. Didn't interest me. Jewishness didn't interest me. You weren't really practicing. I was not your, like your, most yeah. Jews in New York. Yeah. You know, we had a, I had a bar mitzvah, but it was more like a party for my my parents and their friends. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, I recall it in some of my travels. I came across a very exotic young woman from the Bronx in Italy on a boat. And she gave me the address of a kibbutz in Israel. She said, whenever you find yourself desolate, you need a place to stay, make some extra money, go to Israel. So I showed up at a kibbutz on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and the rest is history. Which kibbutz did you go to? It was called Kibbutz Ha'on. It's uh, on the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee, okay. which is the land of the Gadarenes. Yes. By the way, the demoniac. Well, the demoniac was... Yes. And I'd lived there for a while, and then um, to make things more comfortable for myself in Israel, I was told that my situation on the kibbutz would change the moment I became a citizen. Because I was just a volunteer like everybody else. And they said, what do you mean? Well, you know, you, you, your situation on the kibbutz would be completely different. I mean, at that time I was sharing a room with three guys, and I had a ventilator on the ceiling, it was really hot and miserable, muggy. And uh, I said, okay. So I went into the town of Tiberias, went to the Ministry of the Interior. I said, okay, I want to be a citizen. They said, okay, sign that. 
Mazel tov, you're a citizen. I said, that's it? That's it? How, you didn't have to prove your, your Jewish history? My, your, I'm Cohen from New York. It's not like I really needed to convince anybody. <laughs> right? And you have the name Cohen, so <clears throat> Cohen in Hebrew means priest, so high you had that going not for you. Not just priest, high priest. Okay, well, yes. <laughs> okay. That's right. You're not a Levite, you're a Cohen. But okay. it's, it was called the law of return. Right. Um, because of the Jews being dispersed amongst the nations for, for a long period of time. And once Israel became uh, an independent country, the first law that was passed was called the law of return. That any Jew who decides that they want to live in Israel is an automatic citizen. So I became an automatic citizen. And then when I returned to the kibbutz, um, my position really did change. I didn't have to share a room with anybody. Um, I was part of the kibbutz, a citizen. I got my own apartment with AC, Mr. Popularity, and wow. uh, that was it. You know, I became, unfortunately... But then, but then you had to go into well, the Israeli unfortunately, army. unfortunately, about three months later, I received a letter. I couldn't read it. It was in Hebrew. Yeah. I couldn't read Hebrew. And I gave it to the secretary of the kibbutz, and she said to me, you know, mazel tov. This is the second time someone said mazel tov to me. <laughs> and I said, what does it say? Oh, you're going in the army for two years. I said, I just get out of the army. I'm not going to go in the yeah. So anyway, I did my stint, and that was that, yeah. Yeah, so when I first met you, again, 20, like 24 <clears throat> years ago, um, you had just become a believer. Oh. And, um, but kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of rare. Israeli tour guides, a lot of them are not believers. No. They're right. Told so you, so you have, uh, like, the best of both worlds, where you know the Jewish history, Jewish culture, being Jewish, being also a believer well, in, I, I, in Jesus. Well, what I decided was this, is that uh, a future of any kind of tourism in Israel is that also you, you need to know, know just not Old Testament, but also New Testament. Right. Uh, and also come across as though that you're very sincere to everybody. Um, but again, there, there are plenty of guys who, who are just regular guides, yeah. but the deal is once you, you take a tour guide course and everything becomes rhetoric, then people don't necessarily take you seriously because it's like you're just reciting something that you learned. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start with this question because, um, and I'm going to read out of Genesis 15, um, where God speaking to, before Abraham's name was changed to Abraham, Abram, and he said uh, to, this is Genesis uh, 15 verse, 18. It says, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt, the Nile, to the great river, the river Euphrates. So originally, God's intent for the nation of Israel was a huge swath of land. But Israel's never occupied Never it. occupied here, all that. So here's my question to you, because um, I, I had lunch with a Jewish rabbi who... Um, is the rabbi of a synagogue in Washington, D.C. This is about uh, four years ago, maybe. Um, he, he had read something in the paper about me and, and called me up and said, can we, can we have lunch? And uh, just an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. And so his thing was, he does not believe that Israel is entitled to the land. I had to point him to his own scriptures to, to tell him that. But what I have found, Ronnie, is that a lot, a lot of Jews in America think obviously very differently than Jews in Israel. A lot of Jews in America don't really see the entitlement of the land. Why is the land so critical and why is that a debate? Okay, M much of the Jewish community in the United States, besides the ones that literally follow the laws of Judaism, um, many people who were born Jews just go through the motion of being Jewish. In, in, especially like in New York. Um, they don't deny being Jewish, but they never picked up a Bible in their life. They have really no connection to anything. So therefore, Israel doesn't, yeah, it's not very important to them, not yeah. at all. Um, the whole idea of land was, again, you, you're going back 3,000 years. Um, Israel never took over all that area that was promised to them as, in Scripture. Right. In other words... Uh, even during David's reign, yeah. they didn't Well, even that. during... David was a conqueror. David was a warrior. But I think the time that land was acquired was during the time of Joshua. Yeah. 
uh, trying to fulfill something, the land of Canaan and, and spreading about. And at that time, the 12 tribes of Israel were actually, we had three tribes that were on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Yeah. All right. So, but again, depending on the king, depending upon the conquest, the, the boundaries of the land changed many, many times. But it is the most fought over piece of real estate on the planet. Because Israel tends to be a land bridge. If you picture in your mind a map of Israel, you have Egypt and Africa to the south. You have Asia and everything to the east. By the way, Israel is Asia. You know, there's no, there's no continent called the Middle East. Yeah. And then you have Europe in the north. So that became a land bridge between three continents. It became a major trade route, and everybody fought over that trade route. Because if you controlled that, that trade route, you controlled money. If you controlled money, you had power. That's why that particular land bridge was the most fought over piece of real estate for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's still being fought over. Talk a little bit about, and we have some Palestinian Christians in our own congregation, but there's, there's a big battle still between Palestinians and Israel. I'm going to tell you a big cliche right now. Some of my best friends are Palestinians. Yeah. I mean, we work together and it seems very unique that a lot of times when I may see like a restaurant uh, that has hummus or they have this and that, sometimes they're joint ventures between Israelis and Palestinians together. Um, I think once the Jews and Palestinians are out of the Middle East, they're like the best friends. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it all depends on what the, the, the core of the, the problem was. And really, the Jews and the Arab community never had any strife between them before the British showed up. Anybody hear English? Yeah. <laughs> it was during the mandate period, right, right after the First World War, where all this animosity began between Jew and Arab. Actually, up until then, they were very, very close friends. And for them, the common person who they, people that they didn't like were Christians. Because? Because well, yeah, you, have the, you have the Inquisition, the you have the Crusades, uh, right. you know. So they were slaughtering Jews was, and Muslims. Unfortunately, when the Crusaders came into the Holy Land like a thousand years ago, they killed everybody, Muslims and Jews. Right. So they didn't, they had a very foul taste in their mouth because of all of that. But Jews and, and, and Arabs are both Semitic races. They got along very, very closely. And then what happened? This is what happened, as far as, as I know. Um, you had an area you had an area where there was, there was a, a Jewish population and an Arab population during the time of what's called the British Mandate. After the First World War, the French and the British kind of split up the Middle East amongst themselves right. at the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And you know, the French took all of North Africa. The Egypt took the region called Palestine uh, and Iraq. The French took over also Lebanon, Syria. And uh, so you had spheres of influence. But there's never been an absence of Jews uh, in, in, in Israel or in that region, in the region called Palestine. There was never an absence, although there were many, many wars, although uh, there were many conquerors that came, and many times the Jews were just uh, tolerated in their own homeland. Um, there's always been a Jewish presence there. And uh, really, the whole idea of nations and everything forming really only occurred after the Second World War. You know, you had what was called the, the British Mandate for Palestine, okay, or the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration, The Balfour Declaration in 1917, during the time when the British were there, yep. they said that Palestine is the Jewish homeland. Okay, thank you. Well, you've only been there 3,800 years. <laughs> um, but um, again, that, that whole area did not have independent countries. I mean, the Jews and the Arabs got along very well. My wife comes from an Arab country. My wife was born in Morocco. Uh, so there was, but once Israel became an independent nation um, in, in 1948, that's when things got sour. Yeah. Uh, there was fighting. I mean, had there not been a war, let's just say like they say the Arab nations had not declared on war in Israel, things today would be completely different. Israel, of course, would not be as big as it is today, but there wouldn't be any strife amongst everybody. So prior to 1948, Jew and Arab alike, if you were in that land, you had Palestinian on your birth certificate prior to 1948. Prior to 1948, yeah. And so 
people were getting along. Listen, Jews call themselves Palestinians. Because? Because the name Israel, the and, ancient name, had not exactly, come back yet until after back. the War of Independence. So the War of Independence in 1948, what was it, seven well, the, nations well, that came a, against well, Israel? Well, you had seven, the Arab nations were already independent. Yeah. Okay. Um, Palestine, the region, what was called Palestine, was actually both sides of the Jordan River. Right. Uh, and the British created a whole new entity on the other side. At first, they called it Transjordan, right. which means across the Jordan. And then Jordan became independent from the British in 1946. Um, because the Hussein family complained. What's that? D the, Hussein, the Hussein family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Complained. So Churchill. Well, it goes back to the time of like, you know, you've seen it in movies with uh, Lawrence of Arabia. It's the same family that was in that right. particular area. Um, and the region of Palestine was, was always ruled by somebody either sitting in Constantinople or in Damascus or in Cairo. It depends on which caliphate was around that particular region. Um, it was the Ottoman Empire, obviously, until 1916. But after the fighting in 1948, Israel was really small. I mean, most of Galilee, uh, you still had Arab villages there. And then and the strip of land along the coast, which was about maybe nine miles wide. And then you had parts of the Negev Desert. But as far as Judea and all that area, during the fighting, the, the British army was too strong for the, uh, uh, for the Jewish underground that was operating in Jerusalem at the time. Israel didn't have an army. And the Judeanians held on to all of Eastern Jerusalem and uh, and the old city of Jerusalem, and all the West Bank. All the West Bank was called Jordan in 1948. So, um, do we still have the number up anywhere? You guys can, uh, can we put the number back up? Um, because you guys could be texting in your questions, and some are coming in. But explain what kind of a miracle it really was in 1948. Listen, for, for this, the nation this, of you Israel had to trained be Arab armies. Yeah. Israel didn't have an army. Did, I know, they didn't have an army. They had an underground, they had some of the refugees arriving from uh, the Holocaust. Where, they, where did Israel even get, where did the, they, they weren't even the nation of Israel yet. Where, where did the Jewish people get the arms even? Where did they get the arms? Hmm. Okay, many of the Jews actually fought in the British military during the Second World War. Uh, they had what was called the Jewish Brigade in the Second World War. So they had the training. Where did the arms come from? I mean, black market, all the surplus weapons that were left over from the Second World War found their way into the Middle East. Um, most of the Arab countries were either being, they were being equipped and armed by the French and the British at that time. So it was like a ragtag army. As a matter of fact, my dad once told me that he remembers back in New York in 1948, they had agents of the Israeli underground that came to New York and they went around to all the police officers that were Jewish and asked them if they had any like weapons at home, confiscated pistols and stuff wow. like this. And they put them all in suitcases and they brought them to Israel. That's amazing. I think the first Israeli Air Force were uh, four surplus Messerschmitts from Yugoslavia. So what, what we really have, what happened in 1948 was, was a God thing. It's, it's what Ezekiel prophesied about the Valley of Dry Look, Bones. According to the numbers and according to the training of the, of the Arab forces, I can't quite understand how the Israelis managed to defeat them, it or was, at least a ceasefire. Yeah, it was a God thing. The whole thing, the whole, you had seven, at least seven or maybe nine, you had different Arab countries who waged war against, it wasn't even a nation yet, but just, the determination to form this nation, and yet an, the nation of Israel emerged from this victorious against these Arab Listen, nations. Israel was so small after the War of Independence, I'm thinking that had there not been a war and all that, everything would be completely different today. Yeah. Okay, some questions are coming in. I guess we should assume um, different terminology. Somebody's asking, what is a kibbutz? So go back to that ah, one. What is a kibbutz? Yeah, what's a kibbutz? Pure utopia. <laughs> no, seriously, that was the whole idea of a kibbutz. It's like a little socialism happening well, there. Communism. Yeah. But not like communism that you don't believe in God or anything like right. that. Um, some of the Jews who were returning or coming into the region at that time were escaping Tsarist Russia. And things were very bad. It was either you were really, really wealthy or dirt poor. 
okay? And that was the beginnings of socialism. They wanted to do away with the class system. Whereas no one is better than the other, everyone has everything equally. So they started a community where everything is shared. No one's richer, no one's poorer. Everybody works the same work together. You're given a home, you're given clothing. Everybody has the same type of home, the same type of clothing. Nobody makes money. Uh, whatever money the, the kibbutz or the community makes from agriculture or whatever is kept within the, the kibbutz kitty for the... Uh, for taking care of the community. So it was like pure socialism or utopia, which Russia should have turned out to be and did not happen. There are still 207 kibbutzes today in Israel, but they ain't as socialistic as they were uh, way back when. Now they're pretty much capitalistic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you have certain people who learned their trade in, in a kibbutz, like Bernie Sanders. And, yeah, he, yeah, he was a... He was a uh, what trade did he learn? I don't know. He, well, I'm pretty sure it was called socialism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But That's again, they, I lived on a kibbutz for four years. And there was no such thing as socialism. Everybody just worked and, yeah. you know, we got along. Everything was well. And it was self-sustaining. Then that above the law. Obviously, you have to abide by all the laws in Israel, like serving in the army and doing this and that. But... Um, it's a working community, kind of like a, like a commune, like you had in yeah. the 60s. Sure. That's why it appealed to you. There you go, like this young hippie guy. Yeah, but I'm it's from like New York. Love. I had no yeah. idea about getting dirt underneath my fingers and stuff. <laughs> you know, I saw my first cow when I was 16. I wouldn't go near them. I thought they'd bite. All right, some people are asking some prophetic questions, which I'll, I'll try to answer, but let's go back just a little bit, because somebody says, can you elaborate a bit on the animosity that came from Israel gaining sovereignty in 1948? If Jews and Arabs were friends before that, why did it turn so hostile that quickly? So you and I were talking earlier. Um, I, I have a, a Muslim friend who talked to me about how, you know, they've got the, this deep-seated animosity towards the Jews, and he talks about how his grandmother walks around with this key that she, you know, he talks about how she got expelled from her home in 1948 when the Jews came in. And so not all that is, is accurate. Why don't you yeah, talk no, that about that? That key is very symbolic. Yes. By and the it's way. called what? It's called El Nakba. Yeah. Meaning the great catastrophe. Yeah. The great catastrophe was the forming of modern Israel. Look, during that period of time, there was a radio broadcast coming in from Damascus telling everybody to leave their homes because the Jews are going to come and rape everybody and kill everyone. Many of, the, many of the Arabs left, and they were promised that once the war is over and the Jews are defeated, you come back. So some left, some remained. Those who left, many of them made their way into Arab nations. Okay, and now don't forget that the West Bank was still part of the Arab nation, Jordan. But most of, the, most of the Arab population that remained where they were became Israeli citizens. Today we have about a million six hundred thousand Arabs who are citizens of the land of Israel. Mostly Arabs that live in Jaffa, Haifa, uh, Galilee, mm -hmm. the Bedouin in the desert, or Israeli citizens. Well, but 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 part of the the conflict goes to a belief system. And the belief system that some Palestinians have is that they were there before the Jews. And, and you Jews are occupiers. And you guys came in and you took over our land. But historically, the Jews were there. Historically, the Jews have always been there. Have always been there. Um, look, I've spoken to some people who are Palestinians, and they claim that their ancestry were Canaanite. Okay, who knows where the Canaanites oh, no, are? No, but, but that, that's what they claim. I don't know how that works. How would you know that? And yeah. the term... Ancestry. The term know, Palestine or Philistine yeah. comes from Hadrian, the uh, Roman emperor. The Roman emperor. During the Second Revolt against Rome. Uh, they were so angry at the Jews for even thinking of doing a Second Revolt against Rome that they, Hadrian wanted to erase all existence of Jewish history to Judea. So he expelled all the Jews from Judea. They recaptured Jerusalem and turned it into a pagan city and changed its name. And then he took the name of an ancient seagoing people who used to live along the coast. They were called the, the Philistines. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he renames Judea uh, Palestina or Philistine. That's where the term Palestine comes mm -hmm. from, from the Philistines. Somebody says, what is your most cherished location in Israel and why? I mean, if you speak to many Jews, secular or religious, they'll tell you the Western Wall. 
The Western Wall is part of the compound that surrounded Mount Moriah and the Temple Mount. It's not part of the temple, but it's the, it was like the only remaining area that was standing after years and years of being conquered. And um, during the Roman Empire, the, the Byzantines, and then when the Muslims came, that was really the only place that Jews can get as close as they could to where the temple was. Yeah. So I would say the Western Wall, which is called the Wailing Wall. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody's asking, I'll rephrase the question, but it's basically when somebody, and so like in your case, somebody uh, comes to Israel, makes Aliyah, or, or uh, according to that um, law of return. Law of return. How do, they, how do they learn Hebrew? How do they pick up the language? What's, how did you learn it? Um, well, when I was like 12 or 13 years old, yeah. I was sent to Hebrew school okay. so that I could at least read for my bar mitzvah. I had no idea what I was reading. You know, it was like back in the day when you had mass at a Catholic church, everything was in Latin. Yeah. You didn't know what you were saying, but right. you, you knew how to say it. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, I went to Israel, I was kind of thrown into the pool. I, people were speaking to me only in English on the kibbutz. I, didn't, I really? picked up some phrases here and there. Why weren't they speaking in Hebrew? Because all the volunteers were English speaking. And the Israelis wanted to speak English. Oh. But it wasn't quite, then later on, you know, they have this program where you go in for like, like a crash course for three or four months and you pick up basic Hebrew. But uh, I went to the military. I hardly knew any Hebrew whatsoever. Here I am in a, in a foreign army with a foreign uh, language. And I don't know, it just so happened that the people that were in my company were Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxon people who came from English-speaking countries. So they, they were either born here to foreign parents or they came as children. So their mother tongue was, he was English, but they learned Hebrew while they were here. So as I, you know, I had guys in my, in my company from New Jersey, from South Africa, <laughs> Australia. And uh, every time the sergeant said something, I'd say like, what do you say, what do you say? Yeah. Anyway, That's how so you I learned picked, it? I kind of picked it up, yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I mean, we, we can go back and forth. I'm kind of spider webbing, but um, just based on some of these questions, um, what's going on right now in Israel with Netanyahu? And um, you don't have to get political, like uh, uh, your opinion about it. Just say what's actually happening. I'll tell you what's actually happening. What's actually happening. Okay. Um, <laughs> Because when we were in Israel on the last trip in March, uh, it, was, it was difficult getting back to the airport. There were so many protesters. Okay, this is what happened. The last uh, parliament that we had uh, was a very mixed. They wanted to be, not liberal, but they wanted to have mixed. In other words, people who were a little bit right wing, a little bit left wing. We had even Arab uh, representatives uh, that are inside the coalition. It was a mixed coalition hoping that it would work out this way, a dialogue with the Arab population, uh, but it fell through. One person quit, the other person quit, and then all of a sudden we didn't have the majority. You have to have the majority. We have 120 seats in parliament. Whoever has 61 seats, they're the coalition. So we had brand new elections once again. And um, Netanyahu, look, as far as I'm concerned, not, I think Netanyahu has been the best politician that Israel has ever had. He's did a lot of good. The Abraham Accords, where he opened up the doors with the rest of the Gulf states, mm. Arab countries who were, who were like, you know, always at war with us and now friends. Um, and, but what happened was, in order for him to become the prime minister, he needed more than 60, he needed 61 seats. Unfortunately, he didn't have it from his own political party, and they started bringing in ultra right wing from, from settlements and also the uh, Orthodox. Jewish community, and uh, in order for him to become prime minister, he had to make certain concessions and promises to all these people if he becomes prime minister. So he won, he became prime minister, and then now the religious parties are demanding uh, a much larger budget for their community. Um, you have another right-wing community that wants to build more and more and more on the West Bank. Uh, the ultra-Orthodox community demands that their youth don't go into the military. Mm. 
um, and they're getting more funds. And people are very disappointed in Israel today that um, basically Netanyahu sold himself out against right. all of his beliefs to become prime minister. Yeah. Now he's being indicted on three counts of, uh, what's the word I can look for? Corruption. Bri corruption, yeah. bribery, okay? Having trials and everything. So far, everything's been postponed because he became prime minister again after the elections. And he wants to try to change the judicial system. That's what all the protests are about. We have an independent judicial system that doesn't favor one coalition or the other coalition, right? That, that seems fair. Mm -hmm. He wants that his coalition controls the, ju the judicial system and they appoint their own judges in the judicial system. And anytime they come across something uh, as far as a trial, then they could annul it which is good for him because he's about to be convicted. Now he can say, well, we, we decided that we don't need the conviction anymore. <laughs> so the, the, the rest of the country is protesting the fact that it should be independent, not be controlled by a, any particular party. And uh, for some reason, like they're calling everybody who's not for Netanyahu, a leftist and a anarchist and everything. But we have guys, ex-generals and, and chief of staffs protesting what's going on. Obviously, these guys are not leftists. And that's what's going on right now. People are very disappointed that he kind of sold his soul to all these religious parties just to become prime minister. Yeah, trying to get a coalition so that he can be prime minister. He's the longest serving prime minister now in Israel's history. Um, well, it, well, it's because he never really served for four years. It's like he served for two years, had re-elections, right, then yeah. another two years, then re-elections, then yeah. another two years. But all together. All together, a real long time, yes. So some of these questions um, are related to prophetic things about like the building of, of the third temple, uh, how do observant Jews in Israel deal with the fact that they can't offer sacrifices. So do you remember that time we went into the Temple Institute and I, I got our group thrown out because um, that, so there's, there's some really zealous Jews in the Temple Institute who are refashioning all the articles for the temple that they want to have, you know, eventually rebuilt. And then, isn't it, is it the ninth of Av? When do they make a, they make a procession to the temple? Well, now? this is the thing. The, the, the ninth of Av is uh, the, the, the date of the, of the destruction of the temple. Right. Now, it's not a governmental uh, um, procedure that the government really doesn't care if there's a, a third temple or not. Yeah. But most of the people that are now in the coalition would like that. In Netanyahu's coalition? In, in, yes. Well, big time. I didn't oh, yeah. A lot of provocation. You have uh, okay. parliament members doing visits and walking around on top of the temple mount. Really? Which is fine, but not with like, you know, oh, we're going to get this back one day. Right, right. Build a third temple. And uh, for the religious party, they believe that it's important for them to have a third temple. But on the other hand, you know, we're, we're pretty much tolerant of all the faiths in Israel. We don't take over people's mosques or we don't take over people's churches. Um, Jerusalem was captured, you know, during the fighting in the Six Day War. And the paratroopers were like all over the mosque area on top of the Temple Mount. But, um, you know, they still left it in Muslim hands. Yeah. I mean, we have a million and a half Arabs in Israel. We're not going to take away someone's beliefs and everything. Look, we understand that it's uh, the Temple Mount is part of the first and second temple. But today there's a mosque standing there. Right. You know, not unless somebody's going to be like really nice and allow us to build a temple there. I mean, there's also room for both, but there's, it's not going to happen. Well, it's it's not it will eventually happen. I mean, the Bible talks about it prophetically, that there's going to be some agreement where they're allowed to rebuild the temple next to the, the Dome of the Rock. But I remember you saying how Moshe Dayan was the one who gave away the administrative rights to the Temple Mount area. That's he why didn't there's, want, he there's did no statue want, of Moshe Dayan Yeah, or, he or did portrait. not want strife within the Arab world. Right. He said, okay, we defeated like five Arab armies in six days, but I don't know how long it'll take us to defeat 21 Arab armies. Right. Right, I mean, the whole Muslim world would be totally against us. Look, the Temple Mount area and the mosque is still within Israeli territory. Jurisdiction, right. The overall control there is still the Israeli police force. But 
um, the custodians of the site are still Muslim. Right, which is why the Jews just can't go up there and build a, no, no, a no. temple no. because of that. Now, the reason I got, we got thrown out of the Temple Institute is because, and in answering that question, I, you know, I was just kind of provoking on purpose. I said, well, you haven't had a temple since 70 AD. How do you atone for sins? There's no more sacrifices. And you know, she said to me, well, the, the rabbis now say that through prayer and, and, and good works, we can go to heaven. And I said, well, with all due respect, that's not what your own Jewish scriptures say. You have to have a blood sacrifice. You have to have blood atonement. I'm, tr I'm trying to like point her to Jesus. And she's just like, thank you very much. You can go. And so we, we were exited out of the place. But, but, um, but, but they are, you know, ready. With, they have all these articles made for a third temple. Okay, everything ready. Yeah. Even a cornerstone, they have a seven branch menorah. Yeah. That's gold plated. The trumpets and everything. But as far as sacrifice, listen, the way things are politically today in the world, can you imagine all the animal rights groups that are being? <laughs> Peter would be all over it. Oh man. It would be a disaster. Uh, somebody says, is it safe to travel through Israel? Here we are, we're getting ready to take another- Safe travel to Israel? Is it safe to travel through Israel? I, I wouldn't go to Walmart, I'll tell you the truth, in without being here. shot. Yeah. You, you wouldn't go to Walmart here. Listen, every time I open up the internet on American news every day, every yeah. day there's a shooting someplace. He, we were at lunch and he said, why are people, he said, nobody, nobody's concerned about safety in Israel anymore. There's always a shooting in the United States somewhere. Yeah, it no, we true. don't have rampart terrorism running around and people getting shot and everything. We had an incident recently where we were, you know, they shot 1,100 rockets at us from the Gaza Strip, but only like maybe five landed in Israel, all the others were shot out or something. But- um, What's the system called that? Iron Dome. The Iron Dome, but then wasn't there, there's something about David, David's arrow. David's sling. David's sling. Yeah, that's another rocket system. Yeah. Pretty much about 95% of everything that goes up in the air is shot down. That's amazing technology. Yeah. I think the Americans recently purchased it. The Americans purchased it? Yeah, I think they may be using it, putting up one or two or so in the area, like in northern Syria or Iraq, because... You know. Oh, I thought you said we purchase it for ourselves. We might need it too. Who knows what's going to be lobbed our Look, way. Look, every once in a while we have an incident. Every it once happens. In a while. Of someone stabbing somebody, and if it happens to be a, a Jew and an Arab, right away it's called terrorism, you yeah, understand? Yeah, yeah. But in the United States it's just called a crime, you know? Somebody said, do you consider yourself Jewish, a Messianic Jew, a Christian? How would I'm, you describe I'm a, I'm a yourself? Not a, I'm, I am not a practicing Jew. Right. Okay, I have a pretty much an open mind. Yeah. With scripture, both New Testament and, and Old Testament. Because I've eaten bacon with you. What's that? I've eaten bacon with you. Yeah, hmm. you're free, yeah. I remember the first time I went to Israel, so I went with a group of pastors in 1998, and Ronnie was leading the tour to help train the pastors. These were all a bunch of Calvary Chapel guys that I knew, and uh, we're standing up on Mount Arbel, and this one pastor just very innocently just said, Ronnie, did Jesus ever come up here to Mount Arbel? Well, I mean, maybe he did, but you know, it's right, right there by the, on, on the western coast of the Sea of Galilee. And Ronnie starts going into this elaborate thing like, yes, he stood right here. He delivered a wonderful speech. It went something like this. How the heck should I know if he came up here on Mount Arbel? I mean, how would I know? I mean, it's yeah. not really written anywhere. Yeah, it's not I written anywhere. I don't know what he did every day. Everybody wanted to know, was Jesus standing here and he just finally had enough of it? He's like, how should I know? I, I usually say it's 50-50. Either he did or he didn't. <laughs> At that yeah. particular site. Okay, so, we, so we've got just five minutes left. We're taking another group um, because the backlog from COVID, we took 450 people in March. We're taking another group of 200 in October and, we, and that group's already sold out. We have 150 on a waiting list for that group. So we're gonna go in September, we're gonna go like every fall, depending on, we're gonna work around the Jewish holidays. So we're gonna go again in September of 2024, but we haven't, we haven't uh, made that trip open yet. But tell everybody why, if, if they can afford it, and if they have the time, why should everybody go to Israel? Um, 
Look, being people who grew up with the church and grew up with uh, the Bible, you probably have a curiosity to know what everything looked like. Although they give you pretty good descriptions in, script, in, in the Bible, but the moment that you do come to Israel and you see everything for yourself, then all of a sudden the book that you've been reading has now become three-dimensional. Because mm -hmm. every time you read a chapter and they talk about, let's say, the Judean wilderness, or they talk about the shores of the Sea of Galilee or the Jordan River, the first thing that comes into your mind is, wow, I was standing right there. Yeah. So all of this is like completely true because I was there, you know. So in a sense, you become a walking, talking witness because you tell the other people, listen, everything you're reading here is true because I saw it. Mm -hmm. it, it it's pretty much a, a bucket list. You know, you want to really see what he saw. In other words, if you're standing on the Mount of Beatitudes or you're in the area of Capernaum, the topography hasn't changed. It looked exactly as it was 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the Sea of Galilee area is one of the most underdeveloped, except for Tiberias. It's a very pristine location. Like you feel like you're going to The Israeli back in government time. did not want to turn the Sea of Galilee into a Miami beach. Right, yeah. The, so you have, you have that one town, Tiberias, and smaller places along the seashore, but they want to keep its natural beauty. And also the thing is, it's very important for people who are Bible students. They want to see what the land looked like 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Very important, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things when you go and then you, you have your Bibles and then you <clears> realize <throat> I was here and it makes the Bible come alive. So it's, um, you know, eventually we're, we're all gonna be able to go there as believers because eventually the Bible says that Jesus will rule and reign from Jerusalem again for a thousand years. He's coming again to the Mount of Olives. I mean, you know, Israel is the centric story of the Bible because the Jewish Messiah came from that land and the Jewish Messiah is coming back again to that land. So we're not done with Israel. God's not done with Israel. And I'm just gonna close by reading Psalm 122 verses six through eight, and we'll, and we'll pray this. Uh, David says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and may they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. So let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for um, your word. We thank you for the land and the people of Israel. We pray, Lord, for the peace of Jerusalem. And we thank you, Lord, that one day the Prince of Peace will rule and reign from the city of peace, from Jerusalem. And we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for the opportunity, if we're able to go there. Uh, pray your blessing on Ronnie and Molly, and thank you for their friendship. Uh, thank you for the thousands of people that he has led throughout the land of Israel as a tour guide. Uh, Lord, many people have been enlightened and helped because of, of his leading these tours over the years. And we just thank you for him, for Molly. Just pray, your, Lord, your blessing on us. And we pray again for the peace of Jerusalem. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I, I'd like to add yes, one add thing. add one thing. Okay, the passage that you just read, that, that is considered to be a psalm of ascent. People first going into Jerusalem. Um, on their odyssey going up to the Holy Temple. Many times when we're traveling in Israel and we're on that road going up into Jerusalem, we would read that yeah. passage on the bus yeah. as we're making the Psalm of Ascent into the Holy City. Because they would sing that on the way up yep. to Jerusalem. All right, everybody, he'll probably be sticking around because I know some of you might want to say hi to him when we went to Israel, but let's show our appreciation to Ronnie Cohen tonight. Thank you.